It starts with a question. Load women size eight. Followed by an idea. On how to make things simpler. Better. Or more beautiful. Approximate shape from sketches. But it's not just what it looks like. Load cross-terrain sequence. It's how it works. Which means trying. And failing. And trying again. To be a designer means not being bound by the limits of your tools. But instead... Expand box. Being inspired by them. Show me the upper. So that you can focus on what only you can do. Being creative. Being curious. And being critical. Exploring the union between function and form. Until suddenly you know. Optimize cushion pattern for terrain. That's it. And when you're ready to share your work, make sure everyone can see that the world is a little simpler, better, and more beautiful. Who liked that video? So that was just unveiled last week. Nike and Dell, thank you for uh, producing that. Uh, and what they showcased in the video was the Meta 2. And I have it here in my trusty Pelican case. Uh, and the idea is that you could wear a lightweight uh, headset, fully immersive, 90 degree field of view. Um, we're striving to create an operating system that has zero learning curve, where you could put it on and exactly know how to use it. You could uh, express yourself, design, create things. We also have put the compute off the headset so it doesn't get hot. And we create it so you can look out and people can see you. Um, and the idea is to create something awesome. And I was at MIT for a number of years and, it, uh, and loved it, but when I saw that I had the opportunity to create this, this, help build this team to create this great device, I uh, jumped at it. So um, 40 years ago, this was how we interacted with technology. Keyboard. 20 years ago, this is the first laptop that Apple uh, rolled out. They called it the Luggable. 18 pounds, had a golf cart battery in it. Then 10 years ago, uh, touch, um, and what's next? So I think augmented reality is what's next. And if you look at the players that did well in the different waves, you see a number of them going into VR, AR, MR, and I think those uh, are just placeholders. I think we haven't figured out what to really call this next wave of, of uh, interacting with technology. And there are a few charts I want to show that I, I think explain why we were able to raise $100 million to build that device, why people are saying in five years augmented reality is a $180 billion market. And one is uh, where intera uh, interaction technology is going. You went from the punch card, which actually derives from the loom, for people who know their computer history, which was, you were very explicit. You kind of said, this is what I want to do. To where we're going now, where you have contextual computing, where you could wear something and with thought, control. Um, another thing to, to watch is uh, content capture. We went from 2D images, photography, to, to film, to now you can use a Google Tango and scan a room and suddenly have all this information. The last chart I want to show is networking speeds. So with the G3 network, it would take 26 hours to download something that takes 3.6 hours with the G5, which is just around, well, 5G, which is just around the corner. And I think these three slides, the converging factors here make AR incredibly interesting.
So a little bit to know about AR. Many of you may know who created the first AR device. It was a guy named Ivan Sutherland. And I was on the phone with him recently, and he created the Swords of Damocles, and he called it that because it was so heavy that if it fell on you, it would kill you. And he created it not to be the first to create AR. He created it because he had a vision to create a 3D image in front of him using stereo to look at this teapot. And he, he did it at Harvard, and then he moved to uh, uh, University of Utah. Um, and he, he said, John, I, I don't want credit for creating the first AR device. What I'm really proud of is I was able to create something that you could see. And this is the underpinning of the Pixar and the whole animation industry. He went on to do many other things. But in 1968, this was the first AR device. And it was the military that spent a lot of money creating these heads-up displays. And here you see the first one and, and a few uh, later ones. Um, more recently, a friend of mine who oversees the F-16s in Vermont for New England says the headset costs $550,000, and he also didn't know that it, it was called AR. Um, so planes, you know, you have all these dials, but today this is a Dreamliner 787 Boeing. You have less dials because of augmented reality. You can look at the physical world and get digital information. And AR has been around us, and many people don't even realize it. In sports, the yellow line and the, the third and five, um, you know, it's, it's just there. Uh, they tried it originally with hockey, and the hockey fans didn't take to it, but, it, but it's done well here. And, and it's popping up all over the place. Now, I think where we're going to end up uh, soon is that we're going to have a strip of glass where you can do ubiquitous computing, connect with Internet of Things, get data back and forth to augmented reality, where you have a device where you look at the physical world and you get information. It could be a handheld, maybe a phone or a tablet or uh, uh, glasses, to virtual reality where you're submersed in the space. And why I think this is an interesting picture is because people see AR and VR as two separate things. But I think eventually it's going to converge. And VR is going to be a feature of the strip of glass where you can just dive into something or you could pull back. And I think understanding this uh, can also help inform the people that are going to be successful at harnessing this technology. So, interaction. So I mentioned the punch card, uh, the typewriter. I don't know if you know this, but the keys are arranged because that's how people who use movable type would have the letters arranged. And then when they created the typewriter, because they had this technology to, to create it, they moved the keys so it would be even less efficient to type because they didn't want the keys to get caught. And so today, that's how we you know, tweet. That's how we type. We're held hostage by, by this arrangement, this technology. And yet our eye can take 10 to the 8 bits per second of information in. And yet this is how we're communicating with technology. And then came the mouse and the GUI. And the mouse allows you to kind of move around the, the, the graphical interface. And when the World Wide Web came about, the mouse was really helpful. And I think the future of the mouse is no mouse. Because as you think about thinking spatial, where you're not looking at a rectangle and touching it, and you're touching 3D objects right in front of you, what do you need a mouse? What do you need a keyboard for? And then there's touch. I put a Polaroid picture here. I think you guys have heard the story. You know, a, a, a young child touches the Polaroid thinking they can swipe it. Uh, uh, touch has become big. But I think we're held hostage also by touching these rectangles. And then there's the billion dollar industry of voice. And I think voice is going to be even more interesting uh, combined with augmented reality. And here is an 8K screen. I was recently at a guy's office who was showing off his 8K screen. I kind of made fun of him because he was showing a 4K image on an 8K screen. He said, you're wasting the resolution. I think the direction where we're going with AR is that it's not about pixels. Eventually, we're going to have lasers that throw the information into our eyes so we don't have to be in this nuclear arms race of trying to create the most pixely dense uh, screen. And then the contextual computing, I mentioned the thought. Here you put on a headset and you could um, you know, move this ball. And the, the guy behind me, I think he was suspect that it was really happening. But this stuff is happening. It's, it's, it's coming. So this is David Senge, and he's a friend of mine who 3,000 of his countrymen are missing limbs because there was a civil war uh, in Sierra Leone. And he is on a mission to take 3D printers and figure out the soft and hard part uh, of, 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 of um, nubs to create 
uh, prosthetics that, that work. Because he said, when I go home, I would go to Sierra Leone and the people who are missing limbs, they wouldn't be using the prosthetics because they weren't comfortable. And there's a little bit of insight in there. He said, we're not very good at taking technology and biology and kind of mixing them together. And this is the device that you would put your leg in if you're missing a nub and it would tell you where to do it. And Hugh Hare, the PI of that group, is uh, not only a leader of it, but uh, uses the technology. And I show this because I think as we go into the AR space, let's really think, how does our body interact with 3D objects? How does our body interact with digital information on the physical world? And often, we conform ourselves to the technology. And if we really understand neuroscience and really understand you know, how long can we keep our hands up you know, above the heart, it's not that long uh, relative. And that's why I think voice and uh, AI looking at information on how your eye is looking uh, is going to uh, play, play a role. And as we think about robots and as we think about personal robots, uh, I think we're going to be using AR to help interact, help lead, help guide, help uh, work in tandem. And so many people know the drones are coming. So a friend of mine uh, who left uh, I, uh, uh, iRobot to help start a drone company, a drone that could fly for over 24 hours, um, he said, you know, I drew upon my thesis, which was studying a million bats leaving a cave at once. Because it's not going to be one drone that we're managing. It's fleets of drones. It's many bits of, uh, of data. And I think this is overwhelming for an individual. But with, with an augmented reality device where you're looking at 3D objects, you can help interface uh, with this kind of data. Um, I looked to science fiction. And, and uh, Jeff Bezos said that it was Star Trek that was the inspiration behind Alexa. Um, you know, what if a Google Hangout or Skype was so good that you could feel like that person's there? So instead of looking at a 2D screen, you're looking at people 3D. And, and in, in, in this uh, scene in, in uh, Star Wars, you're kind of getting at that. So what if the future of collaboration was as good, if not better, than real people in a real room? I think AR can help get us there. Um, I also mentioned Internet of Things. People are talking about 30 billion uh, Internet of Things you know, in a few years. I think AR is going to help us uh, interact with them. And, and there's some companies that are really saying that uh, AR and IoT, it's that combination that's really going to harness them. So on content, I mentioned here's the first picture. I don't know if you can see the first person ever photographed is uh, in this picture. Uh, we've come a long way since this. Uh, and here's Google uh, uh, Tango. You could scan a room and immediately uh, get all the information. What if AR could give you heightened reality? So instead of seeing what you can see, see things you can't see. So the Navy SEAL, I think they say, we own the night. Um, or what if you could see x-rays? What if you could see terahertz? Um, there are all sorts of things you could add on to augmented reality to make it um, really productive. So this is uh, a few years ago, Autodesk technology, a few cameras immediately made a 3D image of me. I think as we create digital twins of things, and in manufacturing, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for that. AR is going to help us interact with that information, figure out what to do with it, and there's a lot of interesting trends there. So this is in the Silicon Valley of, um, of the airplane business. It was Long Island. This is where the, the first... Uh, um, the flight that Lindbergh did to across the Atlantic took place, and Grumman ended up building uh, this uh, Eagle. It never flew. It was one of the ones that was canceled. And I was standing in front of it, and I was realizing if the people who had to manufacture this had an AR device to figure out what pieces to put together in what order, if the people who put this together could have AR devices that could tell you if there was, you know, if it wasn't put together the right way or if it was malfunctioning, if you could be a spectator looking at this and understanding what exactly happened here and what it was like, like this is a static thing. There are all sorts of interesting uh, implications for AR. So this is uh, Boston, a famous place in Boston. Two train tracks crossed here. It used to be a mud flat and. Um, there's a big fire here in 1872. Uh, Boston University, Emerson, uh, MFA, Museum of Science, Museum of Fine Arts all started here, uh, and, and the Boston Globe. What if you could walk through here and see that information? Then Trinity Church, which is H.H. H. Richardson's uh, building, considered one of the, the best pieces of architecture in North America, was built there. 
And when they built the Hancock building uh, right next door, they were jealous because a New Jersey company built the Prudential building not too far away, and the Hancock building said, we got to build something bigger. They built this building in 76, and every single window started falling out. And they had to put card, um, I think, plywood in there uh, uh, to replace it, and they had to replace it all. That was, you know, for an insurance company, you know, a lot of insurance challenges there, right? Um, what if AR could help prevent that? What if AR could help you see the relationship between these two buildings? There's a whole story about how that building almost fell over and, and uh, Trinity Church was sinking. AR could be helpful in this kind of stuff. Um, so this is the first uh, poster for TED, 1984. It's kind of interesting to see only guys. I mean, you know, ridiculous thinking today. And Nicholas Negroponte gave the first talk. And TED, I think... Uh, Three billion people have watched these talks. It's the third most uh, respected uh, media property. They've done well because they do these linear talks. I think AR is going to change that in that when you wear an AR headset, you could be in control of how you navigate information. And uh, so I think that's something to think about. Under networks, um, you know, here's the, the architecture of the internet beginning 1970. Uh, it expanded now. You know, we have the internet all over the earth. I think this G, the 5G stuff is going to be really interesting uh, for AR. All right, so in terms of AR design, how many of you design things in your business? Okay, a lot of you. And the Nike video kind of got at that. We think the future of design is you can design digitally and experience it without touching things. So here's architects building a building that they could go micro, go inside it, see it outside for life sciences. You could go micro like Ant-Man and, and, and uh, see, see uh, you know, at a cellular level. Uh, for manufacturing, who manufactures things? Um, we think you could be trained on how to do this without touching the physical items. We also think you can use machine learning to look at the parts to tell you how to assemble it. And if there's something wrong and you want to repair it, you can have the real expert not have to go to the machine, but be somewhere else. And that could change the whole incentive program for talent. And you can have people wearing AR uh, and get remote assistance, kind of like phone a friend on uh, who wants to be a millionaire. And uh, we're real excited about that. Um, here's a Tesla car. You know, someone could assemble the car without touching anything. Uh, also, uh, AR could change how we experience getting from one point to another inside the car uh, as we think about uh, some of this technology. Uh, who's in the retail here? Who sells stuff? So Wayfair has 7 million uh, pieces of furniture. What if instead of uh, looking on a two-dimensional screen, you could um, kind of shift through the 7 million items and place them in your home and see it where you would see it and have someone, interior designer, look through your headset and tell you if you have bad feng shui. I don't even know if that's a thing, but I think you know what I mean. Um, and then, you know, repair. Uh, I had my uh, dishwasher broke, and I didn't, my wife blamed me, and she was probably right. Um, and I took out the manual, and you know, what if it's not in your native language? And the manual, you're looking at a PDF, you know, page by page. What if you could look at the item and know, you know, uh, spatially how to fix it uh, without having to look down at, a, at another screen? Um, so this is an image that's personal to me, a picture of a brain. And a lot of doctors are experts in interpreting this brain on a 2D screen. But what if the radiologist could take this picture and interact with the doctor, interact with the patient, interact with the loved ones, interact with the nurses, all through 3D? Instead of people looking at different monitors and, and using different mice, they're all looking at the same hologram at the same time and moving and touching. And I think there are a lot of efficiencies. And you may say, you know, I'm not in the brain scanning space, but I think this has applications in manufacturing in a bunch of different ways. Um, all right, so generations. So uh, on the 25th anniversary of the internet, they threw a party, and I, I, I somehow they let me in, and I got up on stage, and I took a picture of people taking a picture of the people who blew out the candles. And these are the people who blew out the candles. You got Jimmy Wales, who invented uh, Wikipedia. You got Tim Berners-Lee. You got Will I Am, Al Gore, Larry Lessig, all celebrating the web. And what I think is interesting is in this shot, they're holding a camera to take a selfie of themselves. And the reason I think that's interesting is here I'm at the Getty Museum. I took my three kids. And the Getty, they have a big endowment. They gave all of us iPods. Guess what? My kids didn't make eye contact with any of the art. They were looking at the iPod the whole time. 
And statistically, my millennial kids are going to take 25,000 selfies of themselves. That's hours a year. Um, you know, them having a camera looking at them, not looking out at the world. And what I'm excited about AR is that it can help us look out. And the reason I say that is a friend of mine named John Hankey was worried that his kid was turning into a couch potato. And he also thought it was really funny that through GPS he could find this ship that was buried underground in San Francisco. And he called his company after the ship, Niantic, and he produced something called Pokemon Go, which had 500 million downloads, the fastest in the history of the internet, in 43 days. And the reason I'm inspired by this is I don't think Pokemon Go is the pinnacle of AR. I think it's kind of like the solitaire for Windows 3. It's, it's, it's a killer app that at, this, at a certain time, you know, is a big milestone. But what I think it points to is some of you are going to be hiring the kids that played Pokemon Go. And if you can figure out ways to harness this technology, looking out, using the camera, uh, using, you know, AR, there's all sorts of opportunities. So I mentioned AI, you know, this is computer vision, an easy thing to do today. Um, IBM Watson, and, and there's many different versions of this. Uh, I think the way to interface with AI is going to be through AR, as I said at the beginning. And you look at some of the major players in this space, uh, Google with uh, Google Glass. Um, you know, I taught a class making apps for Google Glass at MIT, and by the end of the semester, people were underwhelmed. I think AR... They don't even call it AR anymore. It's called assisted uh, um, uh, reality. Uh, but it had no hand tracking. It was 2010 technology in uh, 2013. And yet Google Tango that came out a year later, I think has gotten some real traction. And you look at what Snapchat has done. They've kind of done similar to what uh, the pager did. They stripped away some of the technology, and they're about to come out with an AR device that doesn't have the mobile phone that I think will do quite well. And you have VR. Uh, as something interesting. This was VR in 96. This is VR uh, recently. But uh, the guy who bought uh, Oculus has said, we're betting the farm on, on AR. And Disney uh, has said, we're not interested in VR. We want, uh, because we have the digital information of our theme parks, we want people to experience them and explore them. And I think with the 10th anniversary of Apple, I think you're going to see uh, a Pokemon Go type thing connected with their maps and eventually some sort of headset. And you don't realize it, but these earbuds are already AR uh, enabled. So I'm at Meta. We create this headset. Here's my son, zero learning curve. He immediately knew what to do with the headset. Um, and you know, we're using it at our office, and I think the future of work is going to be very different with this kind of headset. And if you look at the hype curve, while VR is out ahead, I think AR, this is a time where companies can be really creative and innovative, and you see all the players getting in it, and, and I think eventually uh, AR is going to be five times bigger than, than VR. So in conclusion, you know, this is too much information. We can't handle all this information for AR. Um, and Barmack, who's part of my group at the Media Lab, said, oh, this is what I think it's going to look like. Well, Facebook said in 10 years they're betting that VRAR is going to be the main uh, consumer, and I'm betting that the next generation is going to interact with technology in much more interesting ways than anyone before has. Thank you very much.